Sunday morning, all right? There's no one like you, Jesus. Amen. I hope uh, if you don't believe that by the time you arrive, that by the time you leave, that will be a heartfelt expression of uh, how you perceive Jesus in your own life. Great to have you with us this morning. If you're a guest, we are honored by your presence here. Thank you for being here. I hope the folks sitting around you are nice and friendly. And may I draw all of, your, all of your attention to the screen as we look at our morning announcements. Good morning and welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us this morning. If you are visiting with us today, please take one of our connection cards in the pew in front of you, fill it out and let us know about yourself. We won't knock on your door, but we will send you more information about the opportunities here at New Hope. If you worship here with us regularly, please let us know your prayer concerns and we will consider those on Tuesday mornings when we meet as a staff. Thank you for being here. And we hope that you experience God in a special way this morning. Seniors, today is your last day to sign up for Tuesday's lunch. If you've already signed up, please do not sign up again. We're excited to see everyone this Tuesday, rain or shine, as we learn more about St. Patrick's love for God and his life testimony as he took the gospel to the unreached Irish for over 28 years. Ladies, for those of you that purchased your love t-shirts, they have arrived. We're out in the pavilion today handing them out, so come on out and pick yours up. Our kids are preparing for their Palm Sunday Easter choir performance. The rehearsals start March 10th and they're at 11 a.m. in the office. And this is for pre-K through sixth grade kids. So if you'd like your kids to perform in the Easter choir, rehearsals start at 11. Easter is just around the corner and that means Easter choir practices. They started last Thursday night at 6.30 right here in the sanctuary. If you were not able to attend last Thursday, I hope you will be there next Thursday. 6.30, I'm looking for 40 people to add their voices to our Easter choir this year. I hope you'll come and join us. And speaking of Easter Choir, they met last Thursday night. 25 were there with seven others who have committed. That puts us to 32. We are eight away from 40. And part of you are in this service right now, okay? Last week I did the shotgun approach, all right? And that is I sent the email out to everybody reminding you of that. This week becomes the more direct approach. Your personal name will be on the email that goes out saying, I want you here, all right? This is Easter Sunday. This is not about new hope. This is not about Pastor Tim. This is about the Lord Jesus, the most important day of the year. If Easter had not occurred, we would not be here today. If Easter had not occurred, you would never have available to you the promise that peace passes all understanding. If it wasn't for Easter Sunday morning and what happened that day, you would never ever have the opportunity to experience the promise of joy unspeakable. If it wasn't for what happened on Easter Sunday morning, your sins would never have been forgiven and you would never have been freed from the guilt of condemnation. You understand why Easter's big? There will be folks who will show up in church on Sunday morning, on Easter, who have no desire or interest in God any other time of the year. We have one opportunity to let them know how important that morning is. And so if you can carry a tune, hey, you don't have to read music. If you can carry a tune, you can stand next to somebody who sings and you listen to them, they'll help you get on pitch, all right? And they'll tell you when you're not, okay? And that's okay. You'll work together on this. Uh, in, the, in the choir rehearsal, I showed up at choir rehearsal. I wanted to see with my own eyes who wasn't there. Okay? So, uh, I hope you could. Some of you said, Tim, Thursday nights are so hard, it's our small group. You only, you'll only miss two or three small groups. Okay, or just miss half of them between now and Easter Sunday. Go one week, go to rehearsal the next week. Milo's making it easy for you and Randy this year. They will give you a CD with your pitch on it, all right? Soprano, alto, tenor, or bass. You'll have the CD to rehearse with in your car. They will give you the book that they're going to be singing from. Most of these are songs that you have some familiarity with, all right? Plus, you will meet some new people. Let choir practice be your small group for the next six weeks, all right? It will be terrific. 
All right, thank you very much. I'm moving on off of that one now until we get to 40. Wouldn't you hate to be the one who would have been number 40 <laughs> and didn't show? The Bible says there is now no condemnation. New Hope doesn't say that, all right? So... I'm throwing the guilt out there today, all right? Uh, here's the sign-up sheets. If you, this is for a senior luncheon this Tuesday, all right? If you already signed up, don't sign up unless you forgot that you signed up. All right, okay. Uh, a couple of things I need to highlight real quick. Hey, we had a great men's breakfast yesterday. Mark, what? Oh, church work day's on here. I didn't know that. Where, where is it? Oh, at the back. Oh, yeah. So if you're able to be here on the church work day, which is March the 30th, all right? Uh, Teddy, stand up. Teddy is in charge, all right? One of our elders, our youth group leader, uh, and also, as of last year, took over church work day for me. So he now is responsible, and I love the day that he scheduled it for this year. I will miss my first work day in 28 years, all right? Uh, I'm already committed out of the area, but uh, I hope you show up. And uh, we've got all kinds of things to do from repairing fence to inside cleaning, going deep and doing some uh, uh, internal changes. And so uh, if you're available that day, 7 a.m., if you don't get up that early, come at 8.30 or 9. They try to be wrapped up here by noon. But uh, bring, your, bring your tools with you if you think it might be necessary, both inside and outside tools like extra vacuums, all right, hammers, uh, saws, uh, hose, rakes, whatever you can think of. There'll be some planting that's going on that day. So how, whatever you think you can do, come on out and they'll put you to work, all right? And if you can come, there's a place for you to sign up as well. Thank you. I did not know that was on there. Great men's breakfast yesterday. Mark did a great job uh, getting it ready for everybody. We had 70 men yesterday, and what a wonderful speaker. Doug Cockrell, all right, Doug and his wife used to be in our church. Now they're out in Sanger, and they have a horse ranch that they use to make a difference in the lives of others. And you'll get a chance to hear about that ministry probably in a few months on a Sunday morning, but it was just a great day yesterday. Uh, celebrate recovery. Last week, we honored Eric, uh, who has led for the last 10 years our CR, and uh, we recognized him with a special plaque for his 10 years of service and also announced with you that at the end of the month, Eric is stepping down out of that leadership so he can do other things around the church. And uh, we are excited about that next step for him. That means there is a volunteer position available to somebody uh, in our church who would like to be the leader of Celebrate Recovery. We have applications in the office. If you would like to prayerfully give that some thought. We have a few folks who have uh, already expressed interest, but we wanted you to know about that, and there's an application in the office. Two weeks from tonight is our pie auction. Maybe one of the biggest events we do of the year, all right? And just church-wide and impact of one single night. We usually raise between twenty dollars and $25,000 for our Mexico Mission Project. That's our high school kids going down to Mexico during Easter week. Uh, they do their part to raise funds and resources, and we as a church do our part to completely cover uh, that trip and that expense and that project. So I need you to get out your best recipes, have them made that night, bring them here. I think uh, 5.30? Okay, we kick it off at 5.30. Bring your desserts early so they can get them labeled and ready. If you uh, don't want to bring a food item, but you want to bring a brand new bike, you want to bring something from your work and have us auction it off, uh, please bring those things, and we'll work as hard and as fast as we can to raise funds that night. Now, that being said, I'm going to do something I don't like to do today. Rarely do I like to bring multiple needs at one time to the church body. We try to spread those out. It's a lot of demand. You all have been very, very generous through the years. We haven't said much about our building project in the last month or so, and we won't till after Easter is over. All right? Thank you for what you've already committed and what you're already doing there. We have the Mexico mission. It comes up every year at this time. Uh, we know to be ready for that. Some of you have already set aside. You know what you're going to commit and what you're going to give and share, and we're grateful for that. But we have an emergency need that has come up. Uh, some of you may have seen it posted on the Actus Family Facebook in just the last couple of days. Matt and Shelley Actus are missionaries in Uganda. If you're new at New Hope, they are a family from our church. We are their sending church. We are 80% of their monthly support, all right? And uh, it's our responsibility to see to their needs. Uh, 
They need transportation in Uganda uh, because they can't get out to the villages that they do work in. They can't get to the schools that they've established that makes a difference in the lives of those that we have helped them start and continue to support them. Uh, they have two daughters that are about 10 hours away in, um, in school. And coming home from school, the car that they had purchased when they first arrived in the country basically exploded. All right? Uh, they sent their mechanic that they've gotten to know since they've lived in the country out to pick it up, bring it back to repair it. And once he got there, he said it would be a waste of time and money to repair this. It is gone. So to purchase a vehicle that they can use there is about $15,000. Okay? Uh, I might go there to buy my next new car. Uh, but, but anyway, they, they need a car. They need a car to do the work that they've done. And so... Uh, we're faced with a challenge. We can, I could wait till after the Mexico Mission Project, but that's going to be weeks before we could do something for them. And so I'm not wanting to take away from one or the other. So here, here's what I'm going to tell you. Uh, today, if you can help, put something in an envelope, write on it, act as car. Everything that you give will go towards that. You're just hearing about it today. You're not prepared, not, not sure what you can do today. Take an envelope and write on it, act as car, and put down what your pledge will be that you can do by the end of the month because we need to take care of this as quickly as we can for them. Here's what I would suggest as your pastor, and some of my board's just going to shake their head. Um, if you have a monthly pledge to the building project and you can't do both, then hold off on your pledge this month and give to the act as car. That is a pressing need at the moment. You can make it up at the end or God will provide somebody else to make up what your monthly pledge was for this month, all right? Uh, but if you can, you can do something significant to make a difference, I'd love to be able to let them know, hey, by the end of the month, you're going to be able to get that car so your ministry can continue there in Uganda. Does that make sense? Okay, so however you can help, thank you very, very much. Um, okay, I've covered all those. Let me highlight a couple of additional prayer requests. Uh, Linda Baldwin from our church, uh, her husband's been battling cancer. She has now had uh, stomach surgery and she is recuperating. So please remember Linda. Uh, Gloria Swent, all right, from our church, uh, is going to be having back surgery this Tuesday. Thus the ad in here for the No More Blues closet, all right, which is the closed closet for men and women who are returning back to society out of prison. It's put on by Welcome Home and Prison Fellowship. And Gloria has been their leader for the last few years. And Gloria is going to be down multiple months, all right, after this surgery. So they're in need of a volunteer. And at the same time, you can be praying for Gloria as she has her surgery and recuperates. David James, David Wave, you're in the service. David's over there. David is going down south in the month of April to have one, two, or three back surgeries. And uh, so be praying for David as uh, he waits for that date and then be praying for him as he goes through surgery and his recoveries. This past week, we had a service for Joanne Rutledge. Please be remembering their family for God's care and comfort in their lives. And then this Saturday, here at New Hope, we will be, uh, we will be hosting as well as officiating at the service for Kaylin Borchardt. Uh, Kaylin is the 24-year-old young man that was murdered in a parking lot down off of 99 uh, two weekends ago. And so this is a very difficult time for their family, and be, please be praying for them and for us as we prepare and as a church family host that and encourage them through this particular time in their life. So I know the Borchardt family would appreciate that so very, very much. And yeah, then I was handed one. Richard, wave, Richard. All right, right there. He's uh, found out that uh, the challenges he had with his heart are back. You hard-hearted dude, you. But we're going to be praying, all right, for this and the, the wisdom of your doctors as they continue treatment, and you are a good patient, right? Okay, all right, so we'll be praying for Richard as those important decisions are, are being made. We have a special honor to give today, and so I'm going to ask Cheryl Molinari if she will come forward, please. Cheryl, would you come up here? This is twice in two weeks we're getting to recognize a special volunteer in our church. Good morning, Cheryl. How are you? Isn't she just beautiful? I, I hope when I'm 49, I look near this good, all right? So <laughs> there is a ministry in our church that probably flies under the radar unless you have been a recipient of what they do. There is a ministry in our church called Heart to Heart. 
and it was birthed in Cheryl's heart to get this started here six years ago. And uh, what it is, is it is a card and encouragement writing team of people who if you have been through, if, if we have been aware, been made aware, somebody's told us about it, that there is a need, a challenge, a difficulty in your life, then we let the Heart to Heart team know. And a member of that team, which was under Cheryl's leadership for six years, would buy a card and write a note of encouragement and hope to you on behalf of New Hope Church. How many of you in this room have ever received a Heart to Heart card? Look at that. Look at that. Was it encouraging at a time in your life when you got it? Yeah, twice right there. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been on the receiving end of, of those cards as well. And Cheryl is stepping out of leadership in that area. She did it at the end of the year. Tiffany Jones is stepping into that position of leadership. And so we wanted to recognize Cheryl for this very unique uh, leadership opportunity. I, I am opening part of your gift. There's a card in there that you can read on your own, but... And, and, and I'm going to do to you what I did to Eric, and that is I'm going to give it to you and take it back because we're going to do this again in the next service. Okay? All right? So notice how this is shaped like a heart, as in heart to heart. All right? And it says, Cheryl Molinari, thank you for listening to God's voice and sharing heart, your heart with your family at New Hope Church. Heart to Heart 2019. So somebody take a picture. Somebody take a picture. Fawn, here we go. She's coming. <laughs> she, had, she had to get it wide enough to get me in it. Yeah. Yeah, you may, you may. I, I just want to say thank you to God number one for gifting me with this really precious ministry. It meant so much to me. And I hope a lot to a lot of people mm -hmm. here in our, in our church family. Um, heart to heart is truly what we all need to be, is heart to heart. Mm -hmm. I, I can't thank mm -hmm. Tim and Shelly and Fawn and all of you enough for the opportunity and the belief in the ministry and, and in my passion for wanting to do it to allow me the opportunity to share a little bit of our team's hearts and my heart with all of you. And I hope we will all reach out to one another Amen. in years to come with as much love in our hearts as mm. my, my pastor oh, and my so pastor's kind. wife and our church family has reached out to me to, to do this. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. God much. bless you, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank love you, dear. You bet, dear. And she, um, let me share. Here's a note that Cheryl wrote about her time with us. A heart-to-heart -heart ministry is a loving gift that came from God. Our Lord called at one time, and we've had over 40 who have served in this loving and prayerful heart ministry. God's heart ministry will continue to touch the hearts of those at New Hope and beyond under the leadership of Tiffany Jones and God's heart team. During the six years I served as the heart to heart team leader, God's heart team was blessed with the privilege of sharing a piece of their hearts with many who are going through some pretty difficult times in our church family. Through heartfelt notes, offering love, comfort, encouragement, God's word and prayer, hearts touched. I will always be thankful to our wonderful staff and God's dedicated heart team for allowing me the opportunity to serve God and our church family in a way that nourished and nurtured my heart as well. I truly believe allowing someone to know how much you care shows them a picture not only of our heart, but of God's heart. We all have this privileged responsibility as God's children to show others his child, Jesus Christ. When we share our hearts, no matter how God asks us to serve him, we show others a reflection of the living Christ within us. I have been honored that you wish to honor me today, but this has been a gift that God and my New Hope family has blessed me with. I will always be so, so thankful for having received. So Cheryl, thank you for once again writing words of encouragement to us on a day like today. We are so very, very grateful. This time I'm going to, yes, you may give it a, a round of applause.
I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time, if you would, and wait on us as we have our tithes and our offering. Would you join with me as we pray? My Father, I want to thank you for the life that you share with us. You desire every day and every moment of this day to share all that you are with everything that we need. Father, you just don't give us a little bit of yourself. You give us all of who you are. And all of who you are is far more than adequate to meet every challenge and every need we face today. There may be some who have walked into this building today with a pretty heavy load. It could be a load of guilt because of past failure and sin. It could be a load of frustration because of difficult circumstances and challenges. Some of that frustration may be self-induced. Some of that frustration can come from others in our life. There may be some who've shown up here today, Father, and they have no idea why they've come to church. There was just a sense that this is where I needed to be. This is where I needed to go today. And Father, I trust that they'll recognize this as a divine appointment. A divine appointment that's not going to be taken care of by New Hope Church or its ministry team, but Father, a divine appointment with you. They're here to encounter the living God. And I pray that through the music, through the message, through the connection of heart to hearts in the service today, they will recognize the value of being here. And that something important needs to transpire between you and them before this day is finished. Father, we trust you with the needs that we've expressed here today. We have a need to take care of our Mexico mission project. We have a need, Father, to take care of, of, of a need in Uganda with the Actus family. We have the needs of just daily work here at New Hope Church. And yet, Father, we believe you're big enough for the task. You know how when we don't. You know when when we don't. And so we simply say thank you in advance for the provisions that you provide. We surrender all this to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, as I'm standing there singing, I'm thinking, you know what? If that means a lot to me, because I understand it, it means a lot to me because I've experienced it. It means a lot to me because I believe it with all of my heart. But there was a time in my life when I didn't. I actually have been, um, I didn't have a problem with the clock today. Because I've actually been awake since about 1.30 this morning. There are times that God wakes us up because there's some divine work that needs to be done. I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet. I'm just your pastor. But I firmly believe that there are going to be some folks in today's services who didn't know what that song meant when they arrived, but you will understand what that song means by the time you leave. We have been talking since the beginning of the year about what it means to share our faith with others around us. It hasn't been an evangelistic strategy. It's been looking at the depths of what it is that Christ has done for you and 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 for, you and for me that we hold so dear and so valuable, so precious and so important. And if it is that precious and important to us, then why would it not be important and precious to other members of our family, to our neighbors, and to the folks we've never met on the other side of the world? So how do we share this important, precious truth? Tim, I'm not a pastor. No, you don't have to be to share this. This is the will of God for all of his children, is that we share his love with others. You may not be a public spe speaker. You may not have the gift of evangelism. But all of us have been called to be ambassadors, representatives of Jesus Christ in this world. How do we learn to recognize the opportunity and seize those opportunities? And sometimes those opportunities are right here at church. 
You're sitting next to somebody who's here for the very first time. Did you think about breathing a silent, quiet prayer that they are here by divine appointment because this is the day a change is going to be made in their life? I don't understand why God works the way he does. But he creates divine appointments so that he can get into your life and make a forever difference. We get excited singing a song, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you don't know what that means, that sounds like a really dumb song. I mean, when your son cuts his finger, do you get excited about the blood of your son? No. But when we understand the blood of the Son of God, we get excited about his because we understand what it means. So I hope all of you who are a regular part of New Hope will be in an attitude of expectancy as we go through the message today because I believe there will be some who will understand this message now who didn't understand it before. And some changes will be made. Fifteen years ago last month, our country was hearing the hype about a new movie that was going to be released. Mel Gibson was the director. The church couldn't wait for it to get here. It was called The Passion of the Christ. In fact, if you all remember, we had reserved a theater that year for the release of The Passion of the Christ. It's the biblical account of the last hours of Christ's earthly life. If some of you in here are too young to remember when it first came out, watch it. It's on TV. You can get it on Netflix now, all right? Some claimed after they saw it that that film was too violent and too graphic. I would agree with them that it's violent and graphic. I would disagree with them that it was too violent and graphic. It probably didn't go far enough to illustrate exactly what happened to Jesus that day. Some claim the movie was anti-Semitic, though the producer himself filled his own hand using the hammer nailing Jesus to the cross because he said that he and all who have ever lived are equally guilty in the death of Jesus. Others claim that they believe it really happened, but they share no responsibility in the crucifixion of Jesus. In fact, on February the 27th of 2004, there was a uh, an opinion letter written to the editor of the news journal in Port Orange. Her name, who wrote the letter, was Madeline Evans. And she wrote to her newspaper after viewing the movie, I personally have no problem believing what Jesus did, but I want no responsibility for it. I will, listen to this, I will pay for my own sins. Thank you very much. I would never want anyone to go through so much suffering for me. <laughs> that sounds like an American, doesn't it? Nobody's going to pay for my sins. I'll pay for my own. Do you realize you could not afford to pay the price for your sinfulness? That is also the exact opposite opinion of one who probably saw the crucifixion of Jesus. The person I'm going to talk about a little today is one who had one opinion of Jesus early in his life and a different opinion of Jesus later in his life. And he thought both opinions were biblically correct. You see, the Apostle Paul, who was known as Saul of Tarsus before he became Paul the Apostle, he was a well-educated, well-funded Jewish man who thought the Jewish religion was everything that was important in the world, and this Jesus who came along was going to be the destroyer of what he held precious. And so Saul of Tarsus, his original name, was a persecutor of Christians, was probably present at the crucifixion of Jesus, was certainly present at the stoning of Stephen, one of the first martyrs of the church in the first century. And he thought he was doing the will of God by pursuing, arresting, imprisoning, and crucifying other Christians. He would have never believed the song that we just sang today at that portion of his life. 
But on his journey to arrest some Christians, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And he gave his life that day to Christ. And then he became the writer, the author of 13 books of our New Testament. And this mo most prolific biblical author says this on multiple occasions. You could turn with me, if you would, to Galatians 6.14. That's what I'll read from in a moment. But while you're turning there, let me read a couple of other verses. Galatians 6.14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, Paul says, Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. If you're going to brag about something, Paul says, the only thing we really have to brag about is Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, Paul writes again, But let him who boasts brag in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself that is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. And then in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul thought the only thing that he had the right to brag about in his life since his encounter with Jesus Christ was to brag about the cross and what it did for him. One of the songs that Tim taught us today, there was a line in there that says, you are rearranging destinies. And I believe there's some of you today whose destiny is going to get rearranged because this is a day you're going to do some serious business with God. And here's why you should consider doing serious business with God today if you haven't done already. Let's talk about the cross for a few minutes, the glorious cross of Christ. What I want you to understand is the cross itself is not all that glorious. It's an instrument of death. How many of you have at this very moment a cross hanging around your neck? or hanging from your ears? Just raise your hand. It's, this is not a trick question. It's beautiful. I, I have a cross at home. I don't wear jewelry much, but I have one. Somebody gave it to me. On occasions, I, I wear it. Let me ask you this. How many of you would, would wear an emblem of an electric chair around your neck? How many of you would wear the image of a rifle or a pistol that was used for the purpose of an execution around your neck? How many of you would wear a noose of the Western days of public execution? See, in the Roman mind in the first century, that's what the cross was. If, if we wear a cross for the fact that it's a cross, what we have to understand what we're wearing is, is we are wearing an emblem of execution. That's why Cicero said, I pray we never look at a cross again. Because it was the tool of their government to execute criminals. So you and I must understand it's not the, the cross itself that Paul is celebrating, bragging, or boasting about. It is the work that was accomplished on and through the cross that we are to brag and boast about. See, I dare say that none of your crosses you have on your neck or hanging from your ears that I have at home, hanging on our walls, I doubt if any of them have blood stains on them. I doubt if any of them have nail holes in them. I doubt if any of them a rough, rugged, nasty-looking piece of wood. They're polished gold and silver. They've been made to look beautiful. But we must understand the cross itself is an instrument of execution and death. We do not celebrate the item. We celebrate the work that was accomplished with that item. If I were to ask you what's the most glorious thing in the world to you, and I should have asked that question before I read to you the scriptures because I know what everybody will say now. 
The most glorious thing, of course, is the finished work on the cross of Jesus Christ. But if I were to ask you that at 8 o'clock this morning, what would you have said? Some of you might have said your grandkids. And they're good. They're wonderful. Too bad you all don't have the smartest, best-looking grandkids, but that's okay. <laughs> some of you would say it's your job. It's where you get your, some of you get your identity from. Some of you would say it's money. Some of you might say it's your house. Some would say, man, it would be glorious if I could win the, the, the lottery. But when we hear Paul speak, Paul said on another occasion, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. As I've already shared, the cross in itself was not glorious. It was an instrument of shame and torture. Cursed is everyone, the Jews said, that looks on the tree. Cicero said, far be the cross, not only from the eyes and ears, but even from the thoughts of any Roman citizen. You see, the cross itself does not matter, but the fact that the Son of God died on it is what makes the, the, the forever glorious conclusion to the Christian. Paul did not always think this cross was glorious. He hated the name of Christ. He persecuted him until that day that he met him. And the meaning changes. And so maybe the meaning of the cross will change for you today as it did for Paul on that day on the road to Damascus in a street called Straight. The cross of Jesus Christ is glorious in its revelations to us about what it did. The cross should be glorious to us because of the power that was demonstrated there. And the cross of Jesus Christ is glorious in the future promises that it makes to us. Let me highlight those things very quickly and then I want to share a few of the testimonies of how some of you came to discover Jesus Christ. The cross is glorious in what it reveals as truth. The first thing the cross reveals is the depravity of human sin. Your sin and mine. The cross is the supreme expression of our sinfulness. Sin reached its climax at Calvary. That's why it was so ugly. Our cross here is even made to look nice, all right? The cross that day that Jesus hung on, it was ugly, and it was the expression of our ultimate sin. It reached its climax there. Think about this. Jesus was a Jewish man murdered at the hands of the Jewish nation. It wasn't the Romans who wanted to crucify him. It was the Jews who did. The Romans did their best to get their hands away from him. He was murdered by his own people. Why? Because he told them the truth and he did good deeds. Is that a reason to murder somebody? Jesus told them the truth about who he was. Jesus told them the truth about Mosaic law. Jesus told them the truth about their own sinfulness and hypocrisy. And Jesus went around raising people from the dead, giving blind eyes sight, making lame people walk, feeding multitudes of crowds when they were hungry. Jesus did good things, and yet they murdered him for it. Don't misunderstand me. Jesus was born uniquely to die horrendously. He was, done, he was born to do that as the redemptive payment for all of our sins. But to be betrayed by his own disciples, to be accused by his own religious leaders, to be judged and sentenced to death by his own neighbors is the supreme expression of sin and selfishness. We think we know something about sin. We can read the newspapers. We see it on television. We see it in the lives of those around us. We even find it in the depravity of our own hearts. We know of homes that have been wrecked by sin and lives that are ruined by it, and there are premature deaths because of it. We know nothing of the awful depth of sin until you and I go to the cross and see sin for what it really is. And we see the one who died. And the Bible says the one who died knew no sin because those of us who were sinners couldn't die for ourselves. We couldn't meet the requirements we go to the cross and we say, who is this one that's dying? Why does he have to die? And God the Father answers that question. He says, this is my only begotten son. And he's dying not for his own sins, but he's dying for every sin you've ever had or thought. Our sin is 
the sin that plucked Jesus from the heart of the Father and brought him down to this earth to die on that instrument of execution called a Roman cross. The cross is glorious in its revelations because it not only reveals our sinfulness, but it also shows us the character of God, the character of his justice. Why did God allow Jesus to die? Because God is just. By one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. And now by one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, all of us can find forgiveness for our sins. Just as he didn't make Adam sin, God won't make us seek forgiveness. But he provides for us the tool whereby forgiveness can be offered to us. The cross reveals the highest love in heaven and earth. Think about all the songs that have been written expressing the love of God for us that have their roots at the cross. The cross shows not only how deep our sinfulness is, but how high and wide and deep God's love for us is. The scripture says, herein is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave himself for us. God commended his love towards us when? While we were yet sinners. When we didn't even like God, God died for us. Folks, this is not natural love. This is supernatural love. And the cross reveals the only way that men can be saved. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And Jesus said about himself in John chapter 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. What's the next line? No one comes to the Father but through me. I've had people over the years tell me, Tim, that's awful narrow, isn't it? You know what the answer to that question is? Yes, it is. The Bible says it that way. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to God. It's not hard to find. It's just when you have so many options out there, all of them are on the same road except for this one, for this is the only way. Tim, isn't that mean or cruel? Here's what I've told people over the years. If you can find somebody else that over 800 prophecies written anywhere from 400 to 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ took place, if you can find somebody else that had, had that many prophecies written about him all fulfilled in the life of one person, if you can find another person who was born of a virgin, lived for 33 years on the face of the earth, changed the course of the entire world history in 33 short years, if you can find somebody else who, who is the one that's responsible for the dates you write on your checkbook, if you can find somebody else who people are still talking about 2,000 years after his life, death, and resurrection, if you can find somebody else whose birth you celebrate, whose resurrection you get a vacation day for, if you can find somebody else who accomplished all those things, then by all means, follow them. I've had nobody else reveal to me somebody else who can measure up to that. Oh, but Tim, it's just a matter of being good. How good is good enough? And how bad is bad enough? See, this isn't the issue of being good or bad. This is the issue of being forgiven or unforgiven. That's not complicated. But when we are good on our own merit, we don't think we need to be forgiven, just like that woman who wrote a letter to the newspaper. I mean, how close do you have to be to Mother Teresa to be good enough? By the way, I served in Africa the last four years with a lady who worked for Mother Teresa. She was not as nice as everybody thinks she was when you worked with her. She was a tough gal, man. How close do you have to be to Billy Graham to be good enough? How close do you have to be to Saddam Hussein to be bad enough? Neither one are good enough because it's not about being good it is about being forgiven of any as well as all sin and the cross reveals that to us the cross reveals the only way that men can be saved is in Jesus Christ secondly the cross is glorious in its power the cross has power to draw people to Jesus Christ. John 12, 32 says, Jesus speaking here, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And the next line is what's important. You know what the next line says? The next line is a clarification of what Jesus was saying. The next line says Jesus is referring to his crucifixion. 
I must be lifted up on the tree, on the cross. And if you lift up a crucified Savior who was risen from the dead and let them know what that means, I will draw folks to me. This is a symbol for the Jews. The Jewish people should have recognized this if they were really looking for the Messiah, but they didn't. You see, this goes back to a time in Jewish history when Moses had led the captive children of Israel out of Egypt and they were taken on the promised land and they were whining, grumbling at Moses. And so God sent snakes in their midst to bite the whiners. There have been a couple of occasions I've prayed for snakes. And people started to die. And they yelled at Moses, Moses, help us. And Moses went to God and he talked to God, God, what do I do? God didn't say, tell them to stop whining. They already knew that. God told Moses, take a snake, wrap it around a stake, put it in the middle of the camp and lift it high. And then he gave him Directions. Do you remember what the directions were? Look and live. I will lift the serpent on the stake up in the middle of the camp and you tell the people, if they look, they will live. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, look to me and you will live. Do you know what the symbol for the medical profession is? It's a snake on a stake. Where does that come from? The story of Moses and the children of Israel. Every time your doctor practices, he's giving testimony to a crucified, risen Savior, whether he believes in him or not. If you will look to Jesus, you will live. Oh, there'll be a day in which you will die on this earth, but though you die, yet shall you live again. If you look and live, your sins will be forgiven. Your guilt and condemnation will fall away. And you will now live in this life with the abundant life of Jesus Christ available to you. Joy unspeakable. Peace that's unexplainable. Contentment beyond what you can reason in your own mind. The cross has power to draw people to Christ. The power, cross has power to save anybody. Any of you recognize the name Mel Trotter? It's a, it's, a, it's a name that goes back. If Gil, Gil were here, he'd recognize the name Mel Trotter. Mel Trotter was one of seven children born in Illinois to a bartender who drank as much as he served. In 1887, Mel Trotter, a grown man, moved to Freeport, Illinois, where he became a barber. And shortly thereafter, gambling and drinking heavily. He'd learned it from his dad very well. Four years later in Pearl City, Iowa, Trotter married Lottie Fisher, who was horrified to discover that her husband was a drunk. Trotter later said, I loathed the life I was living. I tried my level best, but it wasn't in me to improve. Trotter lost his job in Pearl City, and he and his wife moved to a more rural area in an attempt to help him stay sober. He lost another job, and they moved to Davenport, Iowa, where Mel tried his hand at selling insurance, a job that he lost the day after his son was born. Trotter began leaving home for weeks at a time, and when he returned after one period of drunkenness, he discovered that his two-year-old son was dead. Believing that he bore the responsibility for his child's death, he contemplated suicide. He stood beside the coffin and swore that he would never touch liquor again. But a few hours later, he stole the shoes from his little baby's feet, and he sold them in order to buy one drink. Hopping a train, he landed in Chicago in January of 1897, where he sold his shoes to buy another drink. Drunk, broke, and shoeless in the snow, Trotter was nudged into the Pacific Garden Mission where he heard a message on Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, and he gave his life to the Lord Jesus. Trotter began a barbering job in the day the very next morning, and he spent every night at the mission. He would play his guitar, and he would sing, and he and Monroe, who was the founder of the mission there, represented the mission to supporting churches. Apparently, he became quite a preacher, and he had a way with words, and one of the lines that was most memorable to folks was he said, lots of people go bugs on religion, but nobody ever went crazy on Christianity. When he died in 1940, he had founded multiple community missions in cities all over the East. Many of Trotter's friends described him 
as having a unique personality. And one recalled that he would pray with a drunk, then stand him on his feet and say, now go home and get your wife and kitties and come back to the mission tonight. And when they would leave, he would slip a dollar bill or a silver dollar in the drunk's hand. And this one particular man said, I heard one drunk say outside the mission door, I will die before I spend this dollar on booze. The mission he founded is called Mel Trotter's Missions. And they're still in operation today, though he has been dead for over 80 years. 77 years. The cross has the power to change people's destinies. The cross has power to mold character. If any man is in Christ, any woman is in Christ, they are new creations in the hands of God. Michelangelo found a block of marble that had been discarded. And under the touch of his skillful hands, he shaped the great statue we know as the statue of David. God takes a miserable character and makes that person into a beauty of holiness. The cross has the power to send people into service. The love of money inspires people to pursue hard tasks. The love of country inspires people to serve in the military. And the love of Christ inspires men and women to serve God around the world. People are inspired to serve God when we stand near the cross. What are you standing closest to? The cross or your job? The cross or your family? The cross or your checkbook? The cross also is glorious in its future promises. Heaven is a picture of home. And what does it take to get home? It takes going by the cross. The geographical heart of London for many decades was a place called Charing Cross. You know what I'm talking about? Does that place really exist? Yes, Charing Cross. All right. There's a train station there, and there also at one time was a big cross. Might still be there. All right. Uh, I asked Mark about it. He said, yes, it's true. At one point, it was considered to be the center of London, and all distances were measured from Charing Cross. The spot is referred to by many who live there simply as the cross. There was a little boy who got lost one day and was picked up by a constable. The child was unable to tell the policeman where he lived. And finally, in response to the repeated questions amidst his tears and sobs, the little boy said, if you just take me to the cross, I can find my way home. And Jesus would say the same to each of you today. If you will find your way to the cross, you'll find your way home. Some of you found your way home because you found your way to the cross already. But I suspect there are a few of you here today who aren't quite sure why you came and maybe now you know. You showed up today because this is the day for you to do business at the cross. This is the day for you to be able to sing like so many of us did. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We had one person in our church who said in their salvation story they received Jesus Christ at 27 years of age. And where and when did they do it? After a work accident on their way to the hospital. See, God pursues us wherever we are. doesn't always have to be in church. Another gentleman in our church said, I invited Christ in my life at age 50. It happened here at New Hope. It happened after my wife's father passed away and Pastor Tim did a funeral for our family and I started coming to church. He said, I grew up as a Catholic. I never understood or experienced the love of Jesus I didn't know why the Father sent Christ to die on a cross. I realized after my first Sunday at New Hope that all that stuff I did growing up and my addiction to drugs and the many times that God kept me from dying when I would fall asleep driving 500 miles a day, that God had a bigger plan for me. Whatever that is, I'm here. And each time I go to church, I know part of that plan a little bit better. Another person said I was 30-something Sounds like the name of a TV program. 30-something when I invited Christ in my life. And you know where they invited Jesus in their life? 
at work. At work. A co-worker and friend had been sharing her faith at work with her. And one day, while talking to that friend, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Another person said, I was 19 years old when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Make Buf Carricker happy in heaven today because it was at Northwest where they gave their life to Christ. Said, I walked in that day because I was frustrated. I needed to talk to somebody. I had no one to talk to. My mom was an alcoholic. That day at, New, at, at Northwest, I found somebody to talk to. <laughs> I love the rest of their story. This person said, I didn't think that really counted because I never went back to church after that. I did find a good therapist that helped me out of a bad relationship. And four years later, I met an amazing man. And I'm still married to him 33 years later. I went through some hard times during some of those years, but I found really good medical and mental help. I've been at the same job for 27 years. I've been married 33 years. Been coming to church here for a while now, and what I realize is I really did accept Christ that day. It did count. It just took me a little while to get there. Another person told me that, that they accepted Christ at five in children's church. We have a children's church. We have children's Sunday school. Requires adults to volunteer to teach. People do find Jesus, and it changes their destinies. It rearranges their destinies. We had another one who was nine years old, also found Jesus Christ here at New Hope and Children's Church when Joel Watson was the teacher. I made reference to this one a few weeks ago. Bethany, I'll use Bethany's name. Bethany came because her older sister, Corey, was a mess and her parents were concerned about her. Corey's out there listening. But in Children's Church, she invited Jesus in her life. Another adult said, I was 10 when I found Jesus Christ at church camp. That's why we still send our kids to camp. Good things happen at camp. Another woman said, I was 17 years old, again, at the chapel at Northwest Baptist Church where Buf was the pastor. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. She actually gave her life to Jesus Christ on a Sunday after she had begged her mother to let her go see the movie The Exorcist the day before. Her mother told her no, she couldn't go see the Exodus until she first talked to Pastor Buf about it. It just so happened that Buf preached about the movie that Sunday morning in church. Instead of going to see the movie, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. Interesting how people will work. God will work in people's lives. Another one said that uh, she was 29 years old and she invited Christ in her life at home after a Bible study. John MacArthur baptized her. Isn't that cool? It's not a better baptism than anybody else's. just happens to be a well-known guy, all right? But she indicated, I was raised in a Christian home in England. I was christened as an infant, confirmed when I was 14. I always believed in the gospel and Jesus as the Son of God. However, this was intellectual. It wasn't until God put a woman in my life who I worked with that invited me to church where I, where I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I was told that I must be born again, and I asked what that meant at a women's Bible study group. And that night, I knelt at my bed and invited Jesus Christ into my life. Maybe you've always believed, but you've never invited. Maybe you've always thought because of who you are and where you live and good deeds that you've done that you were a Christian. But none of us are a Christian until we come to the cross until we understand what the shed blood of Jesus Christ means for the forgiveness of our sins, until we understand that if it had not been validated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday morning, his death would have been a waste of time and effort. You see, if Jesus didn't accomplish it all, then he can't forgive all. And if you have not brought to him all of what you are, a sinner in need of a Savior, and you're not a Christian, it's not by coming to church. It's not by giving money. It's not by doing good deeds. It's not by keeping a list of do's and don'ts. It is by saying, Lord Jesus, I need you. I am a sinner living independent from you. Thank you for what you did on the cross for me. I now want you to come live in my life. If you've never done that, I want you to do that right now. This is a divine appointment for you 
to have your first encounter with Jesus Christ. Vast majority of you, I know you, you already have a relationship with Jesus. Be praying for those around you. So what I'd like for all of you to do right now is bow your heads, close your eyes. And I'm going to say a short prayer. And if you've never invited Christ in your life, you've never really fully understood the value of this glorious cross, I want you to leave here today with better understanding. I want you to leave here today with new birth, the beginning of a, a life with Christ. So pray something like this, but you can use your own words. Lord Jesus, I've known the cross was something important in the church before, but I didn't understand how important it was to me. So Lord Jesus, I'm not even sure what brought me here today, but I am sure that at this moment I need to invite you to come live in my life. I believe that you are who you say you are. You did what you said you would do. And because you were raised from the dead, that validates the sacrifice you made on the cross. So, Lord Jesus, would you please come live in my life? Forgive me of my sin. And help me every day live my life and trust in you until the day you call me home. Father, just as a king would put a sword on the head of a subject and they would become a knight in the king's army so when the cross touches our life we become a child of God thank you Lord Jesus for coming into my life I want to learn more about you in the days ahead with your head still bowed no one looking around but you are here today if you prayed that prayer in your own heart as I was praying out loud would you just quietly raise your hand or raise your head and nod at me and I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I will thank God for this important choice that you made today. But you've invited Christ in your life today. Would you just raise your hand, all right? Okay. Amen. Seen three hands. Any others? This was a date of destiny for you today. Your life will never be the same. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in our midst today. Thank you for coming into lives that have never known you before. Thank you for encouraging us who have walked with you as others have entered our family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.